Hello, I'm Ronnie Eldridge. Welcome to Eldridge and Company. Dorothy Schiff was a grand lady of the last century. She was rich by birth and powerful because she owned the New York Post newspaper for more than 35 years. Marilyn Nissenson tells us about her and those times in her biography, The Lady Upstairs, Dorothy Schiff and the New York Post. Welcome. Thank you. It's a it, pleasure to be here. It's such a, it's quite a story. And what's really so shocking is how important during part of our lives the New York Post was as compared to what it is now and how many people don't realize its history. Well, one of the reasons that I did this book actually was because I, it was sort of backward. I yeah. started out looking for a project that would give me a chance to reflect a little bit about the New York that I knew, yeah. I have known if that's the right verb, and I came upon the name of Dorothy Schiff and thought that's a perfect aperture yeah. because she was so much a part of this city and her paper was such an idiosyncratic um, <laughs> typifier of New York. It was um, for a whole generation of people who were striving to become Americans and people who were looking for a, a liberal voice in the New York community. It was their paper. And I think people identified very strongly uh, as readers of the Post with the paper. Right. It's, it, it, it was, it's the oldest newspaper. The oldest, this is hard to say, the oldest continuously Newing, published uh, okay. daily newspaper in America. In America. And yeah. it was started? Started by Alexander Hamilton mm -hmm. in 1801. His politics, of course, were very different from what <laughs> right. devolved by the time Dolly was in Right. And charge. now look at the other turn. So we've gone the reverted other way back. Completely, yes. But she was a very interesting woman, wasn't she? Extremely I mean, here was a woman who was the publisher of a major daily newspaper in the biggest city around, and yet she was very intertwined with her feminist interest in men. <laughs> oh, absolutely. <laughs> um, a point to be made before we get to yeah. that is that she didn't inherit the paper. The other women of her That's generation true. who uh, came to prominence in the newspaper industry were either like Kay Graham, who didn't start out to be the person who was going to be active, but she, her father owned the paper, and she was sort of groomed in the sense that the Meyer Graham family had a trust in the Washington Post that they owed the community. But her father wanted her husband. He, and, and indeed, her husband ran it first right. until he died, and then yeah. she took over. But she grew up with the sense of the paper as being important both to her family and the city she lived in. <coughs> and for that matter, uh, if a Jean Salzberger, who was never active at the New York Times, but who was the primary owner, also had a sense of the importance of her family's connection right. to the paper and, by extension, right. the city. Dolly didn't have that. And then she you had, had Alicia Patterson. Alicia Patterson, who founded her paper, yeah. yes. Uh, but she came from the Patterson family. She came from a long line of people who <laughs> saw newspapers as important to them right. and to the city they lived in. Dolly didn't have that. She acquired the newspaper kind of accidentally. Um, and then it became her life. But because she was already a formed person, in a way, before she um, probably paid a moment's notice of, to the newspaper, uh, her character, her personality, as I said, was already formed, and her flirtatiousness, her interest in politics, which was both ideological and personal, all those things um, made her unique. Did she have that interest in politics before she married George Backer? I mean, um, before she married George Backer, probably not, no. 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 So George she Becker. grew up in a very... Um, a very well-known German-Jewish family That's correct. in New York. Yes. And um, they were what I call hereditary Republicans. Um, right. Her brother, uh, who, to whom she was very close, was a typical Wall Street Republican. I think he was quite horrified by the politics of the New York Post, although he was always very gracious about it because they were gracious people. Yeah. Uh, but I think she had very little interest in politics until yeah. she married George Backer, who was her second husband and was active in New York Democratic politics and in the she, 30s. she got married very young then. Her first husband um, was someone she married when she was barely in her 20s. Um, that was a marriage that produced two children, uh, but it had no other <laughs> lasting impact on Dolly's life. She, but she came from a family that is, um, well, we'll digress a little bit. You've sure. written a book called Going, Going, Gone. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> the German Jewish, that, that wonderful aristocratic German Jewish culture yes. has become even more assimilated, hasn't it, today? Oh, for I sure. I mean, it's gone. For sure. <laughs> right. Um, and she came from that background. She did. Which I think um, was quite important. Uh, was very important. Um, to back up a little bit, her grandfather, Jacob Schiff, who made the fortune that, that um, 
supported the family, was uh, second only really to um, J.P. Morgan as a um, merchant banker and an underwriter of the vast American industrial growth in the late 19th and very early 20th centuries. And um, he, even more, certainly more than many of the German Jews in New York, took an interest in the immigrant population that flooded into this city uh, in the late 19th 20, and early 20th centuries. He was very involved with Lillian Wald in the founding of the Henry Street Settlement in the founding of all kinds of institutions in New York that were going to help that immigrant population, which many of the German Jews, to their discredit, turned their back on. Um, one of the institutions that served those immigrants, of course, was the Daily Forwards, the, the Yiddish language Daily Forwards. And one could say that Dolly Schiff's New York Post was the English language forwards for the children of the immigrants. That's very interesting. It yeah. was certainly a paper whose predominant personality and whose predominant readership was Jewish, first generation usually, or second generation, but, but new Americans, and a, a population that was, during the tenure of Dolly at the Post, a population that changed from being really somewhat powerless, poor, working or just middle class into a population with terrific um, political mm -hmm. and social and economic clout. Mm -hmm. And the paper was their paper. So she bought, she bought the paper when she was married to George Backer. That's He's the one who was, he was in the city council? He was, was he? a city councilman yeah, and, and he, he was, was a close liberal to, Democrat and yes, very interested exactly. in politics. And that brought her more into it. But, yes. but he didn't buy the paper. She had the money. Well, if you read she the, if the, you paper read the newspaper accounts of the time, uh, George Backer bought the paper. Oh, I see. But in fact, it was her money. Right. Um, and, but then she went home and just George ran the paper and she wrote the checks. Ah. Uh, and that didn't sit very well because the checks got bigger and bigger. And although she was a wealthy woman, she wasn't infinitely wealthy. Yeah. So after about a year and a half, she ended his tenure at the paper, ended the marriage, and pretty much took over and ran it thereafter. Then she married the editor. She married the editor, <laughs> who was a real newspaper man. If yeah. You could say that um, she was, really was savvy in, I don't think this was her purpose in choosing the, hus the second and third husband, but they were men who, who introduced her to the things that were going to matter to her. So George Backer introduced her to democratic <laughs> politics and <coughs> more or less accidentally to the ownership of the Post. And then Ted Thackeray, to whom she was married in the early mid-40s, was a real newspaper man. So he taught her, in a sense, how to run a newspaper. So she had the newspaper during the Roosevelt yes. years and the Depression. Yes. Uh, well, no. The, the, end, it, of the, the end of the Depression. The yeah. end of the Depression. Yeah. Then during the 40s, then later on, it, well, the Second World War. Sure. Yeah. And, and then, then the into post McCarthy. Into McCarthy. Um, that was really when the paper hit its stride. And I, I would have to say the golden years of the paper's editorial um, editorial policy, but more than that, it's editorial courage. And Dolly was very much uh, was She, she active, was very strong in that? Very active. I, I, it's hard to believe that much went into that paper that she didn't personally check out. The memos, the inter-office memos, which were wonderful for me to have because I could read right. them and knew what was going on, must have been very annoying for the editors. Yeah. She just sent out reams of, she was a real hands-on manager. How important was Jimmy Wexler? Well, he was crucial. Um, she hired him. He was a young guy. He worked at PM briefly. Um, and she hired him when I think he was 30 or 31, I can't remember, to be the head of the Post's Washington Bureau. And then within a year when she uh, got rid of Mr. Thackeray and really took over the paper. She brought Jimmy to New York to be the editor in chief. I think he guided her through the political, um, I don't even want to say landmines, just the, the political uh, life of mm -hmm. the 50, late 40s and 50s. I don't think she made up her mind always uh, absolutely on track with his. He, for example, was a much stronger supporter of Adlai Stevenson than she ever was. She certainly was going to support him. The paper was certainly going to support him. But she had her reservations, which it turns out, of course, the rest of America had too. Yeah, right. <laughs> um, but Jimmy was crucial, and they were extremely close. Um, they very seldom disagreed. Uh, and when they did, it was kind of noticeable. Right. And then the McCarthy era came, and they were um, they were quite principled. Very principled. They took on McCarthy. I think it's fair to say that outside of Wisconsin, the New York Post was the first journal to systematically look at the career of Joseph McCarthy and point out um, that he'd, he had begun by being a liar and he continued to be. Now, 
one could also say that the New York readers, and for that matter, the New York advertisers, were going to be somewhat sympathetic to this point of view. Nonetheless, McCarthy had tremendous power, and he, in fact, used it to try and humiliate Jimmy Wexler, yeah. but they never backed down. They also yeah. took on Walter Winchell. It, it, yeah. It's hard to remember how much power he had. It was seems incredible. preposterous. Yeah. But he was an enormously powerful man, and the Post went after him and really brought him down. Yeah. It's so interesting when you look back now and you see G. McCarthy, I mean, um, Joe McCarthy, Joe McCarthy and what he did to people. Oh, how we and how obviously crazy he really was. Yes, and drunk and God knows what else. Right. How the power they have isn't that amazing? It's terrifying. It's yeah. terrifying, and I don't want to get into a long back discuss discussion there, of that. It, Eisenhower could have spoken out sooner, yeah. and that would have helped. Yeah. Uh, that's a different subject. But right. Dolly, to her credit, saw to it that the paper really went after him and didn't back down. Well, what was interesting also was the advertisers didn't pull back from the paper. They didn't. Now, you look at television where they had red channels and mm -hmm. all the different magazines yes. where they went after the advertisers. Mm -hmm. That was a... Well, of course, most of that, that was, was national, national advertising. This, the yeah. Post was mostly local advertising. Right. Even national ads... Um, uh, like uh, car dealer, it was local yeah. dealers that took and the ads. And geared basically to the readers who exactly. were the liberal people who exactly. were supporting So she, she didn't um, uh, risk losing many advertisers. I think that's fair to say. Do you think she was a happy person? I think she has to have been proud of what she accomplished. And I think she has to have, uh, at any given day, thought, look what I've made out of myself. Um, her personal relationships, I think, were a little more uh, fraught. She, uh, she had three children. I think she was, as a working mother in her day, as attentive to them as, as she could be. Um, but she had four husbands. None of those marriages lasted. Uh, she had various other affairs, none of which lasted. She was basically a shy person. So was she a happy, upbeat bright-eyed, optimistic soul, I rather doubt that. And you think it was basically shyness that kept her a little aloof from... I think it was shyness and it was class. She had been raised yes. in a very, very um, uh, guarded world. Uh, she was separated by money from almost all of her peers. I mean, she right. went to Brearley and even there she felt herself to be uh, financially separated from many of her classmates. That's interesting. And did she feel that way because she was also Jewish? Surely that played a part. Yeah. Um, her grandfather, Jacob Schiff, was very, very proud of his Jewish heritage right. and very, um, one would have to say, liberal-minded for the day about assimilation and about the role that Jews could play in the larger community. Her father and mother, who uh, had different pressures brought to bear on them, were both embarrassed about being Jewish. Mm. And uh, that has to have had an impact on her. She was always, uh, well, she, she had to identify as a Jew. It was, it was she, her it readership. Was, yeah, was um, and she was also fascinated by it, but she, right. she really didn't have a clue about the complexities of what Jewish identity meant for most of her readers. Did you, um, you, you we didn't talk too much about PM. Did that have an impact at one point on the Post readership? Because it was the same... Well, PM was a it? paper founded by Ralph Ingersoll, who yeah. had been one of the founders of Time magazine. I think it was founded in 1942. Sometime around um, there. And it was backed by Jock Whitney and Marshall Field, right. among others. And it was certainly left-leaning. Um, the Post was a... Well, it's more like the forts. I mean, the That's way right. You the said Post it, was also just... more of a general interest newspaper. The, the yeah. um, PM was only about politics. Yeah. It, gathered around it a, a core of dedicated readers who thought the Post was, of course, a sellout. Um, but in fact, uh, readers do vote with their dimes, and, uh, or nickels, whatever it cost in those days, and people, did, the, the PM didn't make it. It was too uh, parochial, too, too categorizable, is that a word? But maybe, I don't know. <laughs> too easily to categorize. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she, um, it impressed me that she Never, she wouldn't call herself a feminist, but obviously she was a strong woman. Absolutely. But there were two quotes when she talked about with a young woman when she was saying um, that the post is her life, mm -hmm. and this young woman said, it's not my life, and she said, you must have had a happy childhood. <laughs> right. I really hit you, didn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. I really felt so here I feel sorry for this 
wealthy, <laughs> powerful right. woman, and yes. it was interesting. And the other comment was to Gloria Steinem, mm -hmm. when Gloria said, I don't know if I could ever get married. What did she say? <laughs> I, Gloria said to her something like, um, <laughs> it would be difficult to get married. I, you have to move your books into his apartment, <laughs> or in, you have to combine your books, your clothing, your closets, whatever. And Dolly said, imperiously as she was capable of. <laughs> oh my dear, I have a big apartment. So they just move in and then they move out. <laughs> so it was, yeah. you know, it's a very telling kind of, it those is. are telling comments. Uh, I'd like to give her a point though, not as a feminist ideologue, but as a yeah. practical feminist. Right. Um, she didn't think women should be stopped. She didn't think, she certainly didn't think that there should be anything like what we would call affirmative action. She would never have gone for that. Right. But she thought women should have a fair shake. And so at the paper, uh, there were, whether you did it per capita or any way you wanted to count, there were more women allowed to be general reporters right. at the New York Post than on any other paper in the country for a long time. Yes, I remember that, and all the names that you mentioned. Absolutely, they were really she, very she women. really. Uh, um, Sylvia Porter was at the Post before Dolly arrived, but uh, any yeah. number of women uh, still practicing journal yeah. journalism in New York today right. got their start at the New York right. Post because they knew they could actually get a job there, yeah. and they weren't going to be stuck in the secretarial pool. And people liked working there. People did like working was there. The there was a terrific esprit de corps, particularly in the fifties and sixties. I think. Uh, by the mid-70s when Dolly's worry about the finances of the paper began to override what might have been better journalistic judgment. Um, and when she was tired uh, and tired of the yeah. fray, I yeah. think it must have been less fun to work there. And still, it was, it was collegial, it yeah. was fun, and you could pretty much, if you found a story, you could go get it. Yeah. That was the thing. You were yeah. free to do that. You were free to yeah. do that, absolutely. But I, I wondered when I was reading it, when she got to be so careful about you know, the number of pencils or how you were spending yes. money. Yes. Was that a, and I hate to say it because I am, you know, a feminist, as right. they would say, was that a female kind of way of looking at the law statement? I have a feeling it was. Um, gee, I, I resist don't think that. Men would ever, <laughs> but men would well, never. Her they would think it's not macho her enough. Her grandfather was known for complaining that people didn't turn the lights out when they left oh, their right. offices. So um, <laughs> I only offer that just because I resist. I uh, know you have but, to. But you know, um, it was very interesting. It, she was. Uh, yeah. She was very penny wise. Whether she was also pound foolish is is, right. is, is probably. The and case. I wondered if it came from a sense of insecurity that she needed. I'm sure it did. I think it I'm did. sure it did. It also came from the fact that although she was a wealthy woman, she was not infinitely rich, right. and the paper was, was her major financial involvement. So, um, and it was just about the time in the late 70s that uh, this is a whole other fascinating subject that newspapers were no longer owned by one individual. You just couldn't do mm -hmm. it. They were. Uh, newspaper companies were beginning to buy television stations and other mm -hmm. media. Um, the New York Times for years was underwritten by the fact that it owned its own paper plant in Canada. Um, it, it's, it was just at that moment that a single operator, which is really what she was, uh, was really at risk. And they were facing with the unions and everything, the, the new technologies Absolutely. that were coming in and major price costs. Major costs and major severance responsibilities yeah. for the people who were going to be laid off. Because um, they weren't going to do it. It was a tough time. And she, that was a very important time for her. Was she respected by the other publishers? Uh, she would say absolutely not. She would say, um, in today's language, they dissed her completely. Okay. Uh, most notably, during the very, very contentious strike lockout in 1962-63, mm -hmm. all seven, there were then seven major daily newspapers, and they were all shut down for about five months. And um, Dolly uh, was on the, I forget what they called it, the Negotiate executive the committee, yeah. um, where they barely tolerated her. Walter Thayer, who was the um, publisher of the sure. Tribune, was particularly rude to her. I think it's fair to say that. Um, and then she wanted her lawyer to sit in on one of the strike committees, and Thayer just said, what do you, you know, we don't have to listen to you or your lawyer, essentially. And she really got mad. Um, she also was probably feeling the financial heat, maybe more than some of the others. But I think uh, she said it was because they were so dismissive of her. And I think that's probably mm -hmm. true, that she made a separate settlement mm -hmm. with the uh, unions and went back to press. I think it ended up being about three or four weeks before um, the other papers came back. Did she recover after that? The papers, well, the, well, a lot of papers she, did not. The right? other thing is that she, um, 
She printed she, earlier. She printed earlier. She made a lot of money during the couple of weeks that um, the other papers right. were still out. But more important, the strike really broke the spirit of, of uh, newspaper corporations that had much deeper pockets right. than she had. So within a couple of years, the New York Daily Mirror, which was a Hearst paper, went under. And then there was a brief period when the other Hearst paper, the Journal American, and a Scripps Howard paper, the World Telegram, Telegram Sun, Sun, and the, the Morning Herald paper, Tribune. the Herald Tribune, tried to do a combined effort. It sank all three of them, and there was Dolly all uh -huh. alone. She owned the afternoon, right. and she was one of the only three uh, right. surviving so papers. So what brought the end of the profit-making era? Um, television. Television. Huh? Yeah. Uh, it just, uh, well, several things. Television, globally, that was, uh, afternoon papers all over the country right. were going out of business. In New York, where there were probably more commuters than in maybe any other city except perhaps Chicago. Uh, an afternoon paper could last a little longer because people needed something to read in the train going home. I mean, I should say public mm -hmm. transportation commuters. Uh, nonetheless, um, the, well, the, here's an item. Wall Street stayed open later, so an afternoon paper oh, wasn't going to have the closing the figures. They were going to be on television that night. Yeah. Um, baseball games stopped being played in the afternoon. Yeah. So uh, all kinds of reasons, some of them silly and some of them major. Yeah why afternoon papers sank. I, I, if there's an afternoon paper published in America today, it's an anomaly. Right. Um, so, and, and she saw it. She, she knew saw she that. Was she knew it. she was. Uh, and she was tired. <laughs> she was tired. And uh, she was tired of the fight. And yeah. she was proud of what she'd done, but yeah. I don't think she had the and stomach along to came, go on. Uh, along came Rupert Murdoch, who was a young man at the time. He was very successful in Australia, very successful in London. And uh, he, he owned one, a couple of papers in the yeah. States, but it wasn't as abundantly clear in the States unless you studied his record yeah. in Australia and England what kind of paper he would But produce. he then sold it. Well, he was forced well, to sell the because Post. Because of the television. Yeah, That's he, right. he bought the Post from yeah. Dolly in 1976. Yeah. Uh, a lot of people criticized her. They said, how could you do this? He's going to just uh, turn the politics of paper tabloid. around yeah. 180 degrees, which he did. Yeah. Um, I think she... I think she didn't really want to face that that was certainly the case. Nonetheless, I think she did what she thought was right. right. She cashed out. She saved the financial, uh, uh, she buoyed up the financial yeah. prospects of her family. Yeah. And she also kept the paper alive. That's not to be discounted. That's true. Um, she knew that this guy was going to spend whatever it took to have a paper because he needed a paper for his own needs. And I think she felt she didn't want to close down the oldest continuously published daily newspaper <laughs> in America on her watch. Right. Yeah. Did she, was she still alive when he um, bought the television station? Yes, uh, but she wasn't particularly interested at that point. And then he re that was such a terrible he time. He reacquired, yeah. the, well then there was, there there was those goofy those people, people yeah, on the right. post. It was and terrible. then he reacquired it, yeah. and, and indeed that was better for the Post yeah. when he reacquired yeah. it. Um, but, and she never spoke publicly about any uh, chagrin or dismay yeah. about the change. Well, she was a lady in that respect. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and she retained yeah. some social connections and to she, him. And she, she maintained her liberal roots. I mean, oh, she became sure. a supporter of the nation. A exactly. Was she, and a, was she owned a part of it? She did. She took a, a, an ownership share and then turned it into them yeah. without cashing yeah. it in. Uh, she uh, Ms. underwrote Ms. Yeah. Um, and had, I think, a very nice working relationship with Gloria and Pat Cohen. Yeah. Um, she was happy about being able to be helpful. That's um, lovely. And, uh, and she cared. She was she was true to her liberal roots and ideology to the end. It's, I've always wondered when you write a biography, how mm -hmm. do you do it? Where do you start? <laughs> well, um, as I said, I didn't necessarily start out to write a biography. Yeah. I set out to write a history of this uh, time. Yeah. And uh, then I found a biography subject. And I thought, well, that'll be fun. Um, it, there's a built-in timeline, a person's life. Yeah. And there's a built-in restriction. Um, there are lots of things that happened in New York during that period that I found fascinating, but they didn't have much to do with Dolly Schiff, so right. out. Um, you just begin like any other project. I was in, uh, one of the things that made this project possible and fun was that she, uh, she was a pack rat. Mm -hmm. She saved all, mm -hmm. she saved a tremendous amount of her personal papers and uh, her daughters, she stipulated in her will that they be placed in a public repository. And her daughters chose the New York Public Library because, as one of them said to me, she was such a New Yorker. That's really where they belong. Yeah. Well, that was a, you know, a <laughs> gold so mine for me. So read it. Sure. And also, um, people, I interviewed over okay. 100 people because people are still around who remember, uh, and of course I missed a few, uh, but uh, people were happy to talk to me yeah. about Dolly and about their times. Okay. So you just 
right. build material, and then you begin to see what it's the themes so are. It's so interesting to read about the Times and to read about Thank her. You. And it is it's the Lady Upstairs, and it's printed by, uh, published by St. Martin's yes. Press. But you've written other books. I have. Uh, this is actually at my. Uh, <laughs> At this stage of my career, the first project I've ever done all by myself. I came out of collegial journalism, uh -huh. working in television, and then I worked for some time with a person who was an old friend and a rather newer colleague uh, who had also come from collegial uh -huh. journalism. She'd worked at Time, Inc., and we did a series of books together, which were fun. <laughs> and what's the next book going to be? You know something? I don't know. Oh, I'm, you don't I'm know. open for ideas. <laughs> if you've got one, please how make long a suggestion. Do, how long a time will it take you? Do you? Uh, um, I started this in the summer of 2001 and uh -huh. finished it about a year ago. Uh -huh. So five years. Yeah. Well, maybe you should update Going, Going, Gone. <laughs> right. Let's just briefly tell the viewers what that is. It's, it's a series of essays with black and white photographs of um, things, and that's the really g generic word, that have disappeared from everyday life since the Second World War. So um, there's some obvious things like girdles and, um, <laughs> oh, I don't know. Good uh, humoristics. Good hu we didn't do anything <laughs> oh, like that, but right, uh, that was drive in movies. Yeah. Um, Co um, carbon copies, right? Uh, and then there's some more social patterns that yeah. we talked about. So, so that was a lot of fun. It yes. is fun. Is well, fun. we've come to the end of the program, so thank, thank you very much, Marilyn. And thank and you. I hope it was a great pleasure. It because it was a great lesson. Well, thank you very much. It's thank a pleasure you. to talk to you about it. Thank you. If there are any people you'd like to hear and topics you'd like us to explore, please let me know. You can write to me at CUNY TV, 365 Fifth Avenue, New York, New York, 10016, or you can go to the website at cuny.tv and click on Contact Us. I look forward to hearing from you.